Hello and welcome back. And that is right, today we're returning to the subject of 30 terabyte hard drive. We've already done our review, but this video is a little something of a follow up special for the particularly versed in the world of storage. It's not going to be for everyone, it's going to be a little niche. We're going to look at RAID builds, RAID rebuild speeds, fill rates, pricing per terabyte, and RAID capacity levels there. This is a video for the particular nerds of you out there on hard drives, or as I like to think of it, part of the world's worst video dating profile in the world. I just like want someone like that likes me for like me, who doesn't mind a good night of RAID scrubbing. Someone that will take care of my parity who knows how to spell the word disc with a K. 2.5 and 3.5 inch floppy lovers um, need not apply. So let's hit the ground running. The first thing to talk about is price per terabyte. Now I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well the price per terabyte, it's a 30 TB drive. You just divide the price by 30. But the realistic answer to that is actually a little bit more nuanced. Now, when you look at different websites online, obviously their pricing is going to vaguely change. But I saw the Seagate Iron Wolf drive knocking around for about 599. And again, that is without tax. You've got to factor that in with British and European pricing always shows inclusive tax and the US doesn't. And when you look at the Exos series drive, it's around about 699 a lot of, of websites there. So again, we're gonna look at those in a little bit. Now, the reason I'm saying the pricing is a lot more nuanced, it's because you're gonna have multiple of these drives. The minute you have more than three drives and you start engaging in things like RAID 5 and RAID Z, where the storage is spread over and parity is calculated across the drives as well, unlike a mirrored drive or even a drive on its own, it actually brings down substantially the price per terabyte the more drives you have. Now, as you can see from the chart there on screen, the price generally can sit around the low $20 mark uh, to a few dollars more for the Exos there price per terabyte. And obviously the more drives you have, the lower the price per terabyte as the parity spreads out. However, what's interesting is when we start looking at the petabyte level. Drives like this are being designed that people can start hitting petabyte levels a little bit more excessively. And as you can see, a one petabyte drive level of the Iron Wolves sits at RAID 5 configurations around $20,000 to $22,000. And on the Exos, we saw it around twenty-four dollars to $25,000 there. But I think a lot of users would agree that the minute you're talking about pet petabytes and the minute you're talking about this number of drives, you're going to be looking at multi-disc parity. So if we look at um, a RAID 6 or a RAID Z2, that's when the pricing changes of around six to seven hundred. Because obviously, you're only really adding one more drive. So the calculation isn't hugely different. It does bring down, obviously, the price per terabyte ever so slightly, but ultimately, you are looking at around twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar spend to hit a petabyte level, depending on the rate configuration you are going to go for between these two drives. There, so yes, it is making a petabyte more accessible, but it certainly hasn't exactly brought the price down to any kind of even slightly conceivable affordable level. Next up, the fill rate. These drives at 30 terabyte, a lot of you in the comments were going, oh, I could fill that up with my Plex collection in no time. And I'm not saying that isn't true, but what I'm saying is no time is quite a relative statement there. Now, 30 terabytes, depending on whether you're going to look at it in terms of decimal or you're going to be looking at it in terms of binary, most operating systems run on binary there, uh, but their classification of data there, you're either looking at, in terms of decimal, 30 million megabytes there, or around 28.6 in terms of uh, your operating system and how it will view it in binary. However, the reported maximum transfer speed of this drive is maximum 275 megabytes per second. Now, even if we wanted to go bunkers and ignore things like system overhead, uh, sequential block data not being completely ideal, um, network connections, simple, inconsistencies in right let's imagine in some perfect utopian world that we are able to maintain exactly 275 megabytes per second consistently forever it's a million monkeys on typewriters again um, it would take 31 hours and 47 minutes to fill this drive 31 hours we need some way to measure that in terms of relativity and i think i found the perfect way um, that is the movie The Godfather Part 2, Francis Ford Coppola directed Mario Puzo based novel movie, an absolute classic, you could watch that movie nine and a half times in the time it will take to fill this up. Or to be more precise, 9.44 uh, GFPTs. Now, that is a lot of time to fill this drive up. 
Next up, probably the most requested thing that people wanted to know about with these drives post review was to do with raid build times and raid rebuild times. Now, I went ahead and used this. This is the Locker Store 4 Gen 3 from Acer Store, and I went ahead and installed four of these 30 TB drives inside. Now, full disclosure, I had to use two Exos drives and two Seagate Ironwolf drives because that was all I could get hold of there. So I appreciate I don't have a pure similar four disc build there between them. However, I got them installed inside and I wanted to set up a RAID 5 uh, with a BTRFS file system. I know I said file system twice there, get off my back. No! I also know there's gonna be users out there that said, why didn't I use a true NAS system and just go straight into something like RAID Z? It would have been quicker. I needed to go for a test that would be more applicable to more users. And given that turnkey NAS solutions, the majority of them don't support uh, RAID Z, I'm going to go for traditional RAID, hence why I went for the RAID 5 option there for our testing. Now, in the Acer Store software, it displayed 81.84 terabytes of usable storage. Remember what we mentioned earlier on about binary and decimal calculations. And I went ahead and started building that RAID 5 configuration. Now, unsurprisingly, it took a wee while. It was only a RAID 5, uh, so one disk parity, uh, but it was still four drives having to do that build. Um, so with nothing else happening on the system, it took 32 hours and 51 minutes. I know what you're thinking, that was 9.76 GFPTs of time that uh, passed trying to build a RAID 5 on this. That was without doing anything else. We didn't play <clears throat> with any RAID sync or resync variables. We kept everything as default, and that is how long it took. And this is a fairly powerful enough system where there would have been no system limitations in that RAID build. Now, when I wanted to do the RAID degradation test there, just to see how long it would take to rebuild, I wanted to put some data on this. Now, I already told myself early doors, I wasn't gonna fill this up to the brim. I wasn't gonna go 100%. I know a lot of users would have liked to have seen that, but I think as interesting as that would be to see, I think we also have to realistically estimate that most users aren't gonna have this at 100 and then leave it be. Once it gets to 100, you're gonna start swapping out drives. So I went and aimed for 50 to 60% fill on this device. Now I went with lots of mixed data, lots of uh, photo, video, document, uh, multimedia data there, kind of average day-to-day -day stuff. I know I could have gone with SSH and uh, coded, uh, gone down to just block it all out. It would have been a lot quicker, but that felt slightly less realistic. And I thought if I've gone this measure, I might as well play around a little bit there. So in the end, because it was taken overnight and I wasn't always here in the office, I ended up filling it up to 63.82% full and that took happened about noon on the 23rd of July. That ended up totaling 53.02 terabytes of space occupied on those disks. Now I did that with uh, backup, backing up inside the system and externally within the system as well as creating new directories with that data moved around the system. It wasn't just reusing background to duplication, it was fresh data every time there. And that took two days and three and a half hours. So again, just a little over two days days of real world data moving around inside there. I know obviously with the hard drives, the IO as they were, individual operations suffered because of it, but at the same time, once you've added them up over, they, you still ended up hitting around 200 megs over just to write all that data in there. But that's it, we got to 63% utilization and I got ready to do my RAID rebuild test. Now for the RAID rebuild test, as mentioned, I only had these four drives, so I didn't have a lot to play with there. So what I did was when the RAID was completely uh, finished, I then rebooted the system. Um, I then removed one of the drives while it was in the system, already with the system running there. And after a very short period, the system went into RAID degradation. Now, rather than reintroduce the drive immediately, because I didn't want to really look at resilvering there, uh, particularly because I'm not sure resilvering is supported on their platform in this way, I just went ahead and took the drive, stuck it the docking station and then use disk part to wipe the drive. And even if I only did a quick wipe, the idea was that NAS wasn't automatically going to see it and we had to do a full RAID rebuild. And then I reintroduced the drive into the array and then started the RAID recovery. Now during this RAID recovery, I made sure that none of the background operations, those some of those backup operations or write operations, they were all ceased. On top of that, I did not play with a RAID resync priority. It was all set to default because I didn't want to nobble it in case you, you know, if you use RAID resync priority, then it's heavily dependent on the power of the system that you're choosing to use. So I thought leave it by default and then let the system take its time relative to the drives and the system operation. Now that started at 12.36 midday on the 23rd of June. 
How long did it take? Well, unsurprisingly, it took a bloody while and it ended at just after six o'clock uh, in the evening on the 25th of July, 20 past six to be precise. That took a total of 53 hours and 44 minutes. And I know we're all thinking it, we all wanna know, that equates to 15.96 Godfather part twos, which is kind of insane at that point. And if anything, it only kind of underlines what a lot of people were commenting on the previous video, that once you start getting into this scale of storage, there are so many new considerations that most domestic NAS users never have to think about. Not only because it takes a long time for that recovery to take place, but also because it's such a long amount of time. Think about that, 53 hours when the device was at um, around 60 odd percent full. So much can go wrong in that time. Like if you had that RAID recovery happening and you didn't have your NAS connected to a UPS, wouldn't you be slightly nervous in the event of a power failure? Someone accidentally walking over a plug, uh, a plug, someone switching it off to connect to Hoover or a phone charger. On top of that, obviously the system's performance are going to dip as well, depending on the power of the system. I didn't really measure read-write performance because it would have been incredibly relative to this V3, uh, VC3000 powered NAS system. But nonetheless, these are all a big consideration for those looking at larger hard drives that obviously it's very easy for us to say, oh, your RAID times are gonna take longer, both on the build and in the event of a recovery. But I think we have to think about the dangers that can happen within that period. And if anything, these tests prove to me that 30TB drives as desirable as they are, I don't think home users should be thinking about buying these without knowing that information. I'm not saying they shouldn't buy them at all, but I think brands like Seagate, like WD, could stand to be a lot more transparent and loud about factors like that. If you're gonna go down the road of getting big drives like this, and particularly when they do start discussing the easy road to petabyte ownership, they need to be a lot clearer about having safety provisions in place as, a, as an ancillary precaution in the event of the drive failure, not just the drive build either. Again, UPS is as standard, but I look forward to talking to you guys more about this in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. There's a link to the review and hopefully the updated test article below. I'll hopefully get that done very, very soon. But apart from that, if you are interested in getting hold of some of these drives or some of the other devices I've spoken about today, then please, please use the links in the description to do so. But only use it if one, you found the video helpful and useful, and two, you were gonna to go to those shops anyway. If that's true, use those links. A small commission comes to me and Eddie here at NAS Compares. It's just us, and allows us to keep doing silly videos like this and write our articles in the, the support section. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.